Hi, my name is Carrie Ray Barnum. I am the executive director for New Shelves Books, and we are here for Free Advice Friday, the hour every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern, where we get together to talk about book marketing, publishing, anything having to do in the author or publishing wheelhouse. We are live at newshelves.com slash FAF, and you can also email questions in advance to info, I-N-F-O, at newshelves.com, and we do our very best to answer them on Fridays. If you can't join us live, don't worry about it. It. We do have a replay that goes up on YouTube on Monday mornings, and that is youtube.com slash new shelves books. And we also do a, a hot topic feature on our blog on Monday. So that's just new shelves.com slash blog. So many ways to reach us. And of course, we love when you join us live. We do have quite a few people on the call today, which is always fun. I had a couple of emailed questions in, and then I've got some questions in the chat already. And no big surprise, uh, one of the questions or several of the questions involve a PCIP block. Last week, you will probably recall that we talked about the Donahue Group going out of business. They made their big announcement last week that after 28 years, they are going out of business. And the Donahue Group is who New Shelves has been recommending for years for PCI key blocks. We love Pat and Tanny over there. They are awesome. But with them going out of business, we are kind of pivoting and seeing who else is available to do PCIP forms um, in blocks. And a PCIP block is a value added feature for librarians. It catalogs your book for the library system. It gets it into the online system, the OCLC and the Sky River system so that librarians can easily look up your book. They can easily catalog your book. They can check it right in and put it on their shelves. They don't have to put it in their cataloging office and let it sit there for weeks, months, or even years in some cases before it gets on the shelves. So Donahue Group, I did talk to Pat. They are definitely going out of business. Now there is some talk about Pat um, and possibly Tanny going over to a new company called Cassidy. And I did actually have, um, I had a nice chat with Pat over at Donahue Group about how they are processing everything. If you are looking for a PCIP block right now, you can still submit your PCIP request to Donahue Group through the end of April. And that is what both Donahue Group and Cassidy have requested. Keep on submitting through the Donahue Group through the end of April, and all of those PCIPs will be delivered before the end of May. So you will still be getting your PCIP form. It'll still be Pat and Tanny doing it. You don't have to worry about a thing. After the end of April, it looks like another great company to work with will be the Cassidy Group. And um, Cassidy is a company. It's again, a small family owned company and they are adopting a lot of the um, practices that Donahue Group has used that we love, like an online PCIP form. Um, they do have their own pricing. It is important to know that Cassidy does require that they set up an account. So the first time they set up an account for you, there is a fee. However, that fee, which I believe is $30, is waived if you tell them that you are coming over from the Donahue group. So whenever you do that, make sure you tell them, you know, I am a new customer, but I'm coming from the Donahue group. And I wanted to just show you their form because it is right online now. So if you're looking for a PCIP, um, not right now, but in a couple weeks, you will use this form. I know it's a surprise to no one, but I have to find the right tab. All right. So this is the Donahue um, PCIP form right through here. And this is what we're used to, right? Well, Cassidy now has a form almost exactly like it, which is so nice. It's just CassidyCataloging.com slash PCIP dash form. And it's really close to the same thing. You fill in your information and all of that. One of the main differences between Donahue Group and Casty is that Donahue Group, you check out and you pay at the same time. Casty at this moment does not have that. You actually fill out the form, you get your PCIP block, and they bill you with an invoice, which you can then pay. 
So it's not all in one, but it is pretty streamlined, it looks like, and they are updating um, very quickly to kind of roll in a lot of the great things that Donahue Group does. So as for myself, I will be trying Cassidy after Donahue Group goes out of business. We'll see if Pat and or Tani end up going over to the Cassidy Group. Um, but that's what I know. It seems they're very responsive, a very nice team. Um, and so I'm going to give them a try. And I would recommend that you do as well. Of course, you can always look for another cataloger. The important thing to think about when you are looking for another cataloger um, is that if you're going to work with a cataloger, you want to make sure that they don't just catalog your book. You want to make sure that they're cataloging your book and then they're uploading to the Sky River and the OCLC systems. That is how you get on places like WorldCat. So that is super important. And you want to make sure that that is something that happens or else you're not in the WorldCat system. You're not actually uploaded, which means the librarian still has to do that step. It's just one of those small little things that makes a difference. And we want to make sure that whoever we're using and paying for this service is taking care of that for us. I got that too, Cheryl. We'll be fine. I've got it somewhere else, but thank you. <laughs> um, all right. And once you have the PCIP uh, block, it comes in like a block of text. What do you do with it? You drop it right into your copyright page. Typically, it goes towards the bottom. And you just drop that whole PCIP block into the cataloging page so it's there for any librarians who wish to see it or use it. Uh, you cannot do a PCIP yourself. You can submit to like Donahue or Cassidy yourself, no problem. But to actually create a PCIP, you have to be a cataloging librarian who is trained in this and knows how to catalog your book. And further than that, you have to have software that gives you access to the Sky River and OCLC systems for edits and changes. So the average person doesn't even, I mean, you can't do it. Could you create a block that looks kind of similar? Maybe, but part of the value again is having uploads to the system and making sure that it's cataloged according to the Library of Congress and what they like to see in cataloging systems and what's required for libraries. So this is not something you can do it yourself kind of thing. Um, let's see. Yes, I will drop in both. Let me drop in both links here. So the first link I'm going to drop in is for Donahue Group. This is who I recommend you use and submit to through the end of April. And then we also have the Cassidy Company over here. All right. Well, that doesn't work. All right. So those are the two companies. You've got direct links in our chat. Oh, do I recommend including the summary or hiding it in a CIP block? That's completely up to you. Usually I, the PCIP block that we get from Donahue Group, I use it exactly as is. I just drop it right in there. That's what they recommend. That's what I do. And so far librarians have liked that. So that's what I recommend. Um, let's see. What would you recommend as best practices for approaching local bookstores about stocking my self-published book? Well, Valerie, I think there are a couple of things you definitely want to know beforehand. You need to have your ISDN, <laughs> very important, and you also need to know where your book's available as far as wholesale. 
is your book available from Ingram Wholesale? Now, if your book has been uploaded to Ingram Spark, the answer is yes, your book is available from Ingram, Ingram Wholesale, and that's where a bookstore would order it from. But then the secondary question is, what is your discount? This is something the stores will want to know. And it is important to note that if you're uploading to Ingram Spark, the discount you set on the back end is not the discount the retail store gets because Ingram uh, Wholesale takes a cut. So if on Ingram Spark, which is your printer company, you set your discount at 55%, Ingram Wholesale will take a 15% cut, and then the retailer will get a 40% discount, which is what they require in most cases for sales. So it's really important that you have your title, your ISBN number, you know where your book is available for wholesale purchase, and what your discount in terms are. Is your book returnable? Is it non-returnable? These are the things the bookstore will want to know. I do recommend that you put this together in what we call a book one sheet, which is a one sheet all about your book. It is for sales. It would have a picture of your book, a short synopsis, a little bit about you, some contact information, your ISBN, your trim size, all the pertinent details to purchasing your book all in one sheet. If you're looking for an example or you would like to get a template, if you go to newshelves.com in our store, we do have templates. They're $3.99 for a, tam a Canva template that you can kind of plug and play and put your information in. Or you can create one yourself. If you are someone who is graphically able to do that and you like doing that kind of thing, you can create your own one sheet. Just make sure it's got all of that pertinent information, title, ISBN, where the book's available, the price, the retail discount, all of that is what you want to know. The other thing I would recommend is when you go into a bookstore, if you are going in, make sure you're going in at a time they're not busy. If they're crowded, if the register is busy, it is not the time to approach them about your book. However, if they happen to seem like they've got some time, maybe they're stocking shelves, that may be a good time to stop and chat. I would recommend that if you have a copy of your book, you bring it in so you can kind of show them what your book looks like. If your book is done well and it looks really professional, that is a selling point. Um, I would also recommend that when you go in, that you bring a printed one sheet with you that you can drop off. And most importantly, in my mind, it is actually most important. It's important to decide whether or not you are willing to do consignment. They may say, we won't order from Ingram, but we do a consignment deal, a 40-60 split where we keep 40, you keep 60, but you're putting your books on consignment, meaning you are just dropping them off. And if they sell, we split the profits. If they don't sell in three months, we call you to pick up your books and no money is exchanged. So you need to know if you're willing to do that. I highly recommend that if it's a local bookstore that you are open to consignment, at least at first, at least to get your foot in the door. And it's also important that if the answer is no, you take it graciously. Thanks so much for your time. I understand, I appreciate you and you walk out the door. Sometimes taking a no or taking rejection well, it's never fun, right? And sometimes it's something that um, is hard. It is, you know, so uh, some people take rejection better than others where it's like, okay, yeah, no problem. And then some people are like feeling like their face getting red and the tears welling up and that happens. It's really important to take a no gracefully. Yes, some bookstores will charge a consignment fee or a setup fee. That's not unusual. It's for their time to get your book into the system. So again, it's a way to get your foot in the door. And it's not something you want to do long term. If your book is selling 10 copies there a week, well, you don't want to keep doing consignment. At some point, you want to say, okay, my book's been selling 10 copies a week for the last three months. I, you know, I don't have any more consignment copies, but I'd love if you'd consider selling continually and ordering through Ingram. So there's a way to segue once you get there. Yes, no. So Cheryl, if it's a 40-60 split, which is very common, 40% goes to the bookstore, 60% goes to the author. Keeping in mind, this is the retail price. So out of that 60%, the author has to pay 
for the copies of the book. And then that's also your profit as well. So 40%, again, is also what bookstores require for a full trade discount. That's what they're making regardless if they go through your order through Ingram. So that 4060 is, again, pretty common. Just know that the cost of the actual book is coming out of your 60%. No problem, Valerie. Ah. <laughs> Everything's falling apart. My button is dying. I think it's new. Uh, time for a new laptop. I've got my keys are like worn off where you can just see white instead of letters and the buttons dying. <laughs> I think it's time for an upgrade. Maybe that's what I'll do with the tax return this year. Yeah, and don't forget, I mean, local bookstores are fantastic, but would your book fit in a local gift store or a coffee shop? Cheryl's got her book um, being sold at the gym. Get creative and think about places where your book would fit in well. If you have a children's book, is there a children's clothing boutique that you could get your book in or a museum store? Think outside of the box because a lot of places sell books, not just bookstores. That's great. Yeah, it's really great too, because when you have those small opportunities like Cheryl at the gym or um, a author I work with is a local coffee shop sells his poetry book. There is a lot of hand selling that goes on when people personally know about the book and it's like the only book being sold on the counter. Um, sometimes there's a lot of hand selling, which is like these people are literally marketing for you, which is amazing. So those little niche opportunities can often sell more than if you were on the shelf in a bookstore with a bunch of other books. So just thinking outside of that box. We love our bookstores. We want to support them. Of course you want your book in bookstore, but think outside of the box as well. Yeah. Uh, I imagine there aren't too many books being sold at the boxing gym. I could imagine that. Let's see, do you recommend an email verifier to clean up email addresses before a bulk announcement? Um, Scott, I typically don't, but I use, I mean, we email out so much at New Shelf. So we've got our, our weekly newsletter and we have other things like that that we do so consistently that um, it's not usually required. I would say unless you've got a thousand people on your list, you're probably fine. Um, and also it depends on how you're sending it. Are you sending it like MailChimp or Constant Contact? Because that'll verify um, kind of innately. If you are sending out personal, a, like a group email personally, um, that's a whole different ball game. And I don't do much of that because of the laws with opt-in and all of that kind of thing. Um, let me see, I had something I wanted to tell you guys. I do have a webinar coming up that I wanted to pull up for you. We have Annalisa Parent who will be um, coming to do a webinar with New Shelves. It's completely free. Um, I just sweet talked Annalisa into giving us her time because she's awesome. This webinar will be on April the 12th at 1 p.m. So that is this coming Tuesday, and it's all about the path to publishing, talking about the differences between the publishing paths, whether you go um, self-published or if you're working hybrid or if you want to really pitch with a traditional publisher, Annalisa is going to share with us kind of the differences and what may work best for you. She is amazing. She's been in this industry for a long time and she's got some really great insights that I am excited uh, to listen in on. So if you're interested in that, it's completely free. You can sign up. I dropped the Zoom link in the chat box and I will also put it on our replay. Um, and I hope you join us. It's always a fun time and Annalise is funny too. <laughs> she actually has an award for humor. So she kind of beats me all the time with that, but I still think I'm pretty hilarious. Yep. 
Anyone worried about the notification that came up that the call is no longer recording? That it's one reason I shared over to Facebook because it also records there and I can save it there. So we should still have a replay, no problem. Checks and balances. I did one thing right today. Oh my goodness. Let's see, an emailed question. Two questions actually. Let's see. I've already gotten an image for my publisher logo, but need to add text. Can you recommend someone who has vector graphic abilities to do that? If you are looking for someone to update your logo, work on your logo, I would typically say go straight to Fiverr and find someone there. However, if you have the image and you just want to add text and you are confident in your design abilities or your ability to pair together what you want to pair together, you can also use Canva. I've done that for several clients going right into Canva, creating a logo, and then you can pull PNG and vector files from Canva. Um, I'm not sure if that's on the free option. We have the kind of paid option, but that is ability there where you can um, plug and go. And that is definitely on a budget. So, and then do I need to transfer the copyright to my publishing company name? No, um, almost always the copyright will remain in the author's name. The author is the one who wrote the work. The copyright is theirs. Distribution rights go to the publisher, but not the copyright. And we did talk about that a couple of weeks ago on Free Advice Friday. So definitely check back on both the blog uh, recaps where we have that because I think I had some links in there as well as I believe it's two weeks ago, the last week in March, we talked about it. So that's on YouTube as well if you've got more questions about um, copyright and who it stays with, but the author. The author keeps the copyright unless it's a ghostwriter that is actually selling the rights of the book to the publisher or to someone else then that's different. All right, I think that was, that's all my email questions today. So if you have more questions, drop them in the Q&A. Whoops, me and all my tabs, I'm just going crazy hitting things over here. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Oh, my husband has something. He's got the crud or something and I'm I'm drinking all my, my vitamin C and hoping I don't get it between him, my husband down with whatever he's got. He skipped work, which like never happens. So he's out and then my dog had surgery this week. Um, it's, it's been a week, you guys. All right. What do you think of Substack as a vehicle for newsletters compared to say MailChimp? Do you know any authors doing this now? I have not used Substack and I don't know much about it, Cheryl. I'm afraid um, that I just don't know much about it. So I can't give you much of an opinion, but if anyone on the call has used Substack or has an opinion on it, please feel free to drop it in the chat. We would love to learn from your experiences. So Bob's saying he's used both. Bob, do you like Substack better than let's say MailChimp or Constant Contact? And if so, why? Is there one you prefer? I love putting people on the spot. It's so fun. So Bob says MailChimp, in his opinion, is the easiest. Is Substack less likely to get trapped in email spam? Mm, that's a good question. I think no matter what, some are just going to get trapped in email spam no matter what, unless you're whitelisted anytime you're using any email service, it's just something that happens sometimes. Yep, always, always, I know it stinks and sometimes you get in that spam folder, but keep in mind that once people open your email, you are considered more safe to their email address. So, you know, at first letting people know, maybe you put it out on social media. Hey guys, I just put my newsletter out. So go check it, go look for it, your spam and, and whitelist me. Then that may help some. Yeah, it's not exactly, it's geared more towards marketers for Substack than for authors. So more of a learning curve. 
email management is another task to be aware of, part of the game. It is, and more and more your email, your mailing list is so important and having to manage it and use it and MailChimp and all those things, it is, uh, it can be a chore. The good news is, is that you can set up automations that welcome people to your mailing list and then automatically put them through a sequence, pain to set up, but once it's done, you're rocking and rolling. Um, and also there are of course options of um, kind of just getting your template ready and cloning your template for a monthly newsletter or something along those lines. So always, always, it is something to be aware of. You do need to set it up. I view it a little bit like a website, one of those things that you do have to set it up once it's set up. Um, you know, once it's set up, then it's not so hard, but you do need it set up. Sometimes you need someone to help you, even though MailChimp is very user-friendly, if it's not your wheelhouse, you may need to get someone to help you with it at first so that it's easy to maintain in the future. All right, whoops. I just made my check go all the way up to the beginning. All right, if we sell through a store, the store collects sales tax. If we sell at a fair or something, do we have to collect sales tax? Yes. So I am not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I am no one. Um, but <laughs> my my little two cents as a non-legal professional is yes, you do have to collect and report sales tax. What many authors do if they're selling at a fair or something like that is they will pick a flat price. So let's say you pick the price of, um, you guys are gonna make me do math. Well, don't judge my math, but let's say, okay, you pick a flat rate uh, price that you're going to do $20. You're going to sell the book for $20 at this fair simply so you can get a 20 and you can be done. You don't want to be asking people for $20 and 10% sales tax. So it's going to be, um, you guys, literally, I can't tell if I'm supposed to say $2 or $20 and 20 cents or $22. Don't judge me. I'm I'm rolling on so little sleep. Thank you. 22, Scott. As I said, don't judge me, you guys. Um, so instead of asking for $22, you are just going to say, yep, it's all good. I'll report this to the IRS as um, I made a sale and I will take care of the sales tax. Or you can reverse engineer it and say that the book was $18 and then the tax was $1.80 and then that covers it that way. So one or the other, you do you do have to report it. Yes, anytime you make a sale, you have to report it and you do have to pay tax because hey, every state likes their tax. I live in New York and they sure like it. So you do have to report it, but there are ways of making it easier. Now, if it sells in a store, just like any store here in New York, we have an 8% sales tax, which means that when we pay a dollar, we're actually paying a dollar oh eight, but the store collects it and reports it and you don't have to worry about it. It's just when you're selling directly that you have to report that sales tax. Um, so yes. Short answer is yes, you do want to record and do it that way. But again, check with your CPA, your accountant, all, all the legal people to make sure that you are doing what's appropriate for where you live and what kind of sales that you are setting up. Now, of course, if it's something like Amazon or Drafted Digital or Ingram Spark, they handle all of that and they give you your tax form at the end of the year and you go off of that. It's painful to watch me do math, isn't it? It really is. And believe it or not, I am the bookkeeper in my family. All right, let me see what else we've got rolling today. If you have questions, again, drop them in the Q&A box. Um, yes, we've heard so much again about this Amazon return policy going on. That is why God made calculators. And I always have one on me. Um, so Amazon, there's all this talk 
about how TikTok um, has gone viral for authors for reading ebooks and returning them. And there has been a lot of chatter about this over the last week or two about how people are seeing massive increases in ebook returns because currently Amazon does not have an ebook return policy that says once you read a certain percentage, you cannot return a book. You can read the whole darn book and return it. Now, with that said, Amazon does kind of audit accounts. And if there are too many ebook returns, they will stop them from returning books. However, people can just create a new account and then they can return that way. They're really determined to scam the system. These people can scam the system. So while there's a lot of uproar about this, and there are authors who are saying that they are getting massive returns from eBooks and Amazon, that is something that eventually has to stop because they won't be able to get into their account or return anymore. But also, maybe it's going to to push Amazon to get some different rules in place. I know there are quite a few um, petitions and change.org and authors kind of putting pressure on Amazon as a whole to stop the returns with a certain percentage. You may recall this was something that came up with um, Audible books. With the audiobooks last year, I think it was, there was a big push to kind of keep people from returning books once they'd gone through a certain percentage of the book. Now they would have to track that more through the Kindle app if they did it with eBooks. So we'll see what happens. I will say that I've talked to a lot of authors and I also, I'm in a lot of authors accounts. I see their sales every week and we are seeing this mainly in a romance and fantasy sci-fi genres. We are not seeing this across the board or I'm not anyway, I'm not seeing this really at all in nonfiction books. I'm not seeing this a little bit in kind of mysteries and thrillers, but not much. Mostly it's, it's unfortunately romance authors is what we're seeing a lot of it in. And those are readers who tend to read a whole heck of a lot. I do hope it's kind of one of those trends that fades out quickly, kind of like when we had teenagers licking doorknobs in the midst of COVID. Um, I don't care when it is, that's disgusting. Licking a doorknob is just never a good idea. Not that I think any of you would do that. Um, but I do hope it's a fad that fades out and that people are really becoming more aware that it does hurt authors. And when you return a book, there is the author is charged a, a one reason why people are so up in arms about it is that when you return a book from Amazon, not only do you, does the author have to return or, you know, automatically, the author returns the full amount of the book sold, but the author does not get refunded for the delivery charge. And any author on Amazon knows that when you sell a book through KDP, there's a delivery fee. That delivery fee is for any books that are on the 70% royalty plan. So if your book is listed at 35% or under, and typically if your book is priced under $2.99, you don't have a delivery fee. You don't really have to worry about it. But if your book is priced over that, if your book's $2.99, $3.99, then you're typically going on the 70% uh, percent royalty plan, which means you're getting more money for your book sold, but there's a delivery fee. And that delivery fee can range from a couple cents to if it's a bigger file, if it's got lots of images, it can be a dollar or two. And so if people are returning ebooks, let's say they return 100 ebooks in a week. Okay. I like to keep my whole numbers for my mapping. Um, let's say that they return 100 ebooks in a week. Not only did you not make that sale and someone read your material, but you're getting charged delivery fees. And if my delivery fees is a dollar per book, then I have literally lost $100 with these returns in addition to the income I would have made with those sales. Um, so, that stinks. It really does. And I feel for the authors who are getting hit with that right now. Um, I do know, again, that Amazon kind of monitors accounts for how many returns they make. So that may end up biting those readers in the butt later. They may not realize that their accounts can actually be frozen for that. However, I do think that there should be some process in place that helps keep 
Amazon users from returning books once they've read it all the way. Um, it is like great customer service gone a step too far. Um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily go to the movie theater, watch an entire movie, and then leave at the end and say, hey, I hated that movie. I want my money back. The movie theater is probably not going to give it to you. Yes, returning books is what the library is for. You got it, Scott. And that's also what KDP is for. Or, I'm sorry, Kindle Unlimited. If you are one of those readers who kind of like reads and returns, doesn't finish, Kindle Unlimited is a great option for you. The author gets paid for the pages you read, but you aren't paying per title. You pay a flat fee. Um, Kindle Unlimited is great for that. The library is great for that. Not so much when you're actually outright buying. It's kind of like buying a dress, wearing it to your fancy event, and then returning it. Um, the same idea. And that's not cool either. It always hurts someone when people do that. And yes, it did kind of go viral on TikTok, but now a lot of people are talking about um, how bad it is. It's, it's awareness for the readers. In most cases, I don't think readers are like out to get authors or like really trying to steal people's income. In most cases, they probably think it's only hurting the retailer. And who doesn't think that Amazon probably has some money to spare? Um, and so that kind of thinking is what ends up hurting the authors in the end. So it's awareness and letting people know. Um, speaking of TikTok, there was this great post that went out from Colleen Hoover. If you don't know, Colleen Hoover is a young adult author, um, or she writes in young adult. She does kind of young adult, um, some adult, but very, a lot of it's like edgy romance, I guess you would call it. Um, and she went absolutely viral on TikTok last year. Her book sales went up through the roof. It was like, it landed her in a bunch of Barnes and Nobles and she's being sold there. Even books that have been out for like six, seven years were going viral, her backlist. I mean, tons of sales on TikTok. And I love this author because she posted recently and she was like, hey, for anyone who's feeling like you've got to do all the social media and Colleen Hoover went super viral on TikTok and TikTok is the way to make sales. So I've got to be on TikTok every day and doing three videos a day. Uh, Colleen Hoover goes, you guys, I don't really post on TikTok. Not only do I not really post on TikTok, when I do post on TikTok, it has nothing to do with books. And she was encouraging authors that while TikTok did absolutely go viral for her, it made her a lot of sales and made her very popular in the last year, that they were not her TikTok videos. It was in fact book talkers or people reviewing and reading her books, making their own videos on TikTok that went viral, not her personal TikTok videos. And I thought that was really encouraging and it kind of helped me with my mindset of, Sometimes we don't have to be on all the social media platforms. We don't have to do all the things. We need to find one or two that we're comfortable with and our readers are at, and we need to be active there. But sometimes simply finding your readers on the other platforms and getting your book in their hands is all you need to do. Excited readers will review and they will market your book for you. That's what readers do, right? When readers leave a review on Goodreads because they loved it, or they share a book with a friend, or when a librarian is like, yeah, we can't keep this book in stock, they're essentially marketing for you. So it's really important, again, to think out of the box, to think creatively about you've got so many hours in a day, where do you want to spend them? And kind of deciding how you can market your book, but also, how you can help or encourage other people to market your book for you in a really organic way. That's the kind of traffic that goes viral. That is how your books sell left and right. Reviews have been, I mean, research studies have shown that reviews are one of the strongest indicators of someone else buying a product, whether it be an Amazon review or me telling my best friend about a book I just read or anything along those lines. Word of mouth, hand selling reviews is where it's at. And if you can really creatively find ways to get a team of people hand selling your book 
and they feel like they're like just doing their own thing or they are just doing their own thing, then that is smart marketing. That is why so many people do these big review campaigns or people will give away free samples of things. That is because they simply want people to talk about their product because the more people know about your product, the more people that are talking about your product, the more people will chance buying your product or know that it exists. Sometimes I work with people on ads and they're like, I'm not getting any sales or I'm not getting enough sales. It's not enough. I don't think it's worth it. And I always say, but is the traffic valuable to you? It's like PR, um, marketing and advertising. The goal is to put a product in front of someone and to use paid ads to get a sale. Our goal is the close. We want to get a sale. PR, however, is different. PR, uh, public relations, that is to spread awareness. You simply want people to know that your product exists. You want people talking about your product so that later when they come across a paid advertisement, they are more likely to buy. So PR and marketing go hand in hand, but they are not the same thing. They do overlap a little bit, but they are different. PR is awareness. And that is why so many times when people work with a, um, uh, a PR company or something like that, they will, you know, well, I didn't get any sales. Correct, you did not, because that's not the purpose. A blog tour, a blog tour typically is not going to get you crazy sales. That's not the purpose. The purpose of a blog tour is to get you SEO online, to get people seeing and talking about your book, to make it so that when someone Googles your name or your book title, something shows up other than your own website. So PR and marketing are both valuable. However, they need to go hand in hand. They have their own places. And if you can creatively get other people to partner with you on PR and marketing, whether it be because you outright pay for it, or because it's a reviewer or something like that, that is a sweet spot that every author wants to find. And it's totally possible. You just gotta get creative and think out of the box. Uh, and that of course is my TED talk for today. Had to fit one in. Um, someone's asking about eye strategy. I do not know who eye strategy is. I don't know anything about them, I'm afraid. So I can't give you an opinion here or there. I will say, as always, when a new company reach out, reaches out to you to market your book and you have had no contact with them, you did not request information from them, always be a little bit wary. Go to your good friend Google, um, search their name with reviews and all that kind of thing. But when someone calls you out of the blue asking for money, that is something I am always very careful about um, because, hey, they're calling. It's like the car warranty people. We're always a little wary of them. Same thing when people are calling about your book out of the blue um, and asking for money, be, be a little wary. <laughs> Trina, am I the only writer that does not have a website? How important is it? A website is very important. A website is your home online that you own. You don't own your Facebook. You don't own Instagram or Twitter and your accounts can be deleted. Your spot online is your website. You own that, you pay for that, and you have full control of it, which is really, really important. Um, and so I think that having a website is very important. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, I helped an author create a Wix website the other day and it was, uh, you know, whatever the hosting was for the year. And I don't know, it's, it's fairly inexpensive. It's a couple hundred dollars a year, maybe, um, maybe I don't even think it was that. Um, so if you're willing to create it yourself, absolutely. If you have to pay someone, you're going to pay a little bit more if you need someone to set it up for you. But I think a website is so important because it's your home online that you own. It's a spot for people to Google you and search you and it's yours to do with as you would. Oh, that's good. Linda's saying Jane Friedman has something about creating a website in a day. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think WordPress is really great for websites, but it's not easy to learn. It's a little bit more of a curve, but Wix, super easy for a website. Um, they have templates, so easy to do. So the most important thing 